All right, let's kick this off. So this uh, support workshop is about the uh, roles in EC2 or in AWS, I should say, um, and how we can use them to perform actions both within um, AWS itself and within the uh, EKS clusters that are hosted in AWS. So this has come up because of some support questions that were raised around how to inherit roles when working with EKS clusters. Uh, it has some benefits in security in that it uh, removes the need to have um, credentials passed in and uh, you can manage everything by assigning roles to uh, EC2 instances and working from there. So the easiest, uh, so the first thing we need to do then to get started with this is to have a role created in, uh, in AWS. And so you do that through the IAM section of the AWS console. Uh, so if we jump into roles here and uh, we'll create a new role, you get a screen here that has a whole selection of the various services in, uh, in AWS that can assume roles to perform other actions. Uh, the one we actually want here is EC2. So we'll click that one. I won't give it any permissions at this point. Um, we, we won't actually see this policy doing any actions in AWS, so we don't need any permissions to, to demonstrate it. But if you were creating a role that granted permission to do something, you know, create uh, EC2s or you know, upload files to S3, whatever, you'd, um, you'd set the permissions here. Likewise, we won't do any tags. So I'll just create a, uh, a test role so I can uh, find that easily and delete it and clean it up later. And this is the important bit here, the trusted entities. So you can see that this role trusts EC2 instances. And we'll see that in a little bit more detail on the next screen. So I go to my test role. You can see this trust relationship here. Um, it's a JSON structure that describes the types of entities that can inherit this role. And what we've said here is that uh, EC2 instances uh, are trusted so they can inherit this role. So I'll cancel that. Uh, and you can see that in action with the creation of a new EC2. So if we go and launch an instance here, Uh, no, that's fine. It's, uh, next, right, so I am role. So this is where we get to select any roles that have been, that have that trust set up so that EC2s can, uh, can inherit it. So I'll create this quickly, although I have one pre-configured already because it does take a minute or two for these instances to start up. What we'll see, this is my new instance. And uh, again, in the details here, you can see that it has the I am role that we just created assigned to it. Uh, and this is one that I created earlier, so it's up and running. And so what I'll do now is uh, log into that and you can see what this actually means. Um, what it actually means to have an IAM role assigned to an EC2. So I'm just logging in now with SSH. And what we can see is if I query the um, instance metadata uh, API, so that's a, a web server that's exposed on all EC2 instances under this IP address, uh, and this is how uh, the EC2 or the, v, the virtual machines uh, get access to some of the metadata that is um, exposed by AWS. And in this case, I've uh, hit the security credentials endpoint and that's gonna return the name of the role that was assigned to this instance. And so what this uh, means is that because I am running code on this EC2, 
I'm actually running it. Uh, any action I take is done in the context of this role. And that's despite the fact that I haven't um, put in any AWS credentials at this point. All I've done is um, logged into the, uh, the EC2 and because that role was assigned to the instance, I get, I, I effectively inherit that role. So we can see that uh, again with the AWS CLI tools. So this command here, get caller. Uh, I think it's identity, yeah. Uh, so this is like a, a who is call. This will show you the, uh, the credentials that the uh, AWS CLI has assumed when it, uh, when it runs commands. And again, you can see the, uh, the test role here. So uh, that means that had I assigned any permissions to, uh, to this IAM role, any AWS commands I'd run here inside this virtual machine would have been performed uh, with the, those permissions available to me. And so this is useful for a couple of different scenarios. Uh, the first one is just avoiding the need to have to share passwords. Um, so there's no, typically the, the way you share a password to get access to AWS is through the access key and secret key. Um, but that hasn't been required here. We've just needed the SSH key that, uh, that grants us permissions to this particular EC2. And the other scenario is you can create um, roles that have very specific permissions uh, for specific tasks. So you can think of uh, a role as like sudo in Linux. You um, temporarily uh, assume the, the permissions that you require to get the specific job that you need done. And that may stop you from accidentally deleting or, or overriding something that you didn't mean to. Uh, and gives you a bit of a safety net there. So what we can do, or well, the way we can leverage this is through workers in, um, in Octopus. Well, there's two ways. You can actually run Octopus. Uh, so if, if I was actually running the Octopus server on this EC2, uh, I'd also inherit those roles, but that's a reasonably unlikely scenario and uh, certainly not something you can do with perhaps uh, hosted because you don't control where hosted runs. So the, um, the more likely scenario is that uh, you'll have a worker. And so in this case, uh, this is my worker. Uh, so 167 should be the same IP as that. And um, by having a worker running on one of these EC2 instances, we also get the ability to inherit these permissions. And so we can see that in action if we run some uh, fairly simple AWS script steps. So I've created a, a run book here with two script steps. So this first one is running on that worker pool. So this is the code I'm running here will be executed in here on, the, on this EC2. And I'm gonna get access to that same role. And you can see I've called that same who am I uh, style of uh, AWS call. Uh, the other, I shouldn't have clicked out, but the other, the second step is perhaps the more traditional one. Uh, so this is, this is actually also run on a worker. Actually, I should go back and show the, this login because this is the actual, uh, this is the bit where we define whether we're using an account or not. So this step here is definitely using an account, uh, even though it's still running on the worker. If we go back here, this run is running on the worker, but we've selected uh, yes to inherit the, the role associated with the EC2 instance. So if I go through and run that, we'll see some differences in how the, uh, how the command line tool um, picks up its identity. All 
Right, so this was the first one, and if you recall, it was run on the worker, and we set the option to inherit that EC2 role. And uh, the, the AWS command line tool has, has returned that we are actually operating in the context of that, uh, that IAM role assigned to the EC2. The second one was passing a, uh, an account. And in that case, the account that we've defined has taken precedence. Um, so any, any AWS command line tool executions will uh, have the permissions associated to this account as opposed to the IAM role. That's, uh, that's currently not used then in that scenario. Uh, and so again, just to point out the, one of those benefits is if, uh, if we had a, an environment where these, um, these EC2s with IAM roles assigned to them are provisioned, we don't need an AWS account at this point. So the uh, Octopus itself could be configured and, and do all its deployments without any credentials. And uh, the, the EC2 instances themselves become the, uh, the way that credentials are managed essentially. And so this has some benefits. If you're doing large deployments, we have some fairly complex infrastructure and you don't want to have to track all the, uh, the passwords that have been given out to people. So uh, one of the limitations until recently, um, this will come out in 2020.4, was that the uh, Kubernetes clusters, the EKS clusters that we define as targets, um, they previously didn't have that ability to inherit the role of the EC2 that they were working on, but we have added that. So this is our master build, and this is 2020.4. Uh, so we do have that functionality now available, and that'll be going out in the next couple of months to customers. So uh, here I have a EKS cluster. This should look familiar if you've followed any of the other previous workshops. Uh, and that's my, my endpoint there. And I am also running, or I've also associated this target with that same worker pool. So this is that, uh, that worker pool that contains the worker that uh, runs commands inside this, uh, this EC2 with the IAM role associated with it. And we get the same kind of um, uh, login UI options here where we can either uh, define an account or we can inherit the, uh, the details of the EC2 that, uh, that the worker is running the health checks on. And so I've, uh, I'll just leave that as it was, which was to have the instance role. And as we can see, if we do a health check here, that's going to go through and complete successfully. Uh, there is a trick though, or there is some configuration that we have to do before we can start using roles um, to authenticate to a Kubernetes cluster. And I've, uh, I've done that configuration previously, which is why this health check worked. Um, but we should go in and have a look at what that, uh, what that configuration looks like. So there is a, a config map in, um, in an EKS cluster that's created for you once the cluster is spun up. So this is not something you create manually. This will be there ready to go. Uh, the config map is called AWS auth and it's in the kube system namespace. And so this is just the, uh, the inspect resource community step that I've shown a couple of times in previous uh, workshops. And so this is just gonna go through and get the, uh, get the YAML representation of this config map for me. And this is what we need to, uh, to edit. This is what I've already edited, but I can show you what the changes were that we, we made.
Uh, okay, right. So this is one of the uh, one of the unexpected side effects of having a uh, a worker assigned to a target. Uh, I will dig into this later, but for now, um, what I'll do is actually change that target back to use the uh, username and password. So if we go AWS, so what I've done is switched away from using the role. I'm going to use a uh, credentials that have already been set up and uh, we'll just switch back to the default worker pool here. So this is your more traditional style of, uh, of cluster configuration where the, uh, the checks just happen either on the server or the uh, whatever the default worker is. I just realized that I think I lost the Right, I lost the cluster name. So that would be, just double check. Yeah, okay. That is, uh, that is interesting. I actually don't recall where I set that cluster up. Oh, here we go, yes. KDS cluster two. So let's put that in there. Try again. Yep, okay, so we're good. So we've reverted back now to the default um, uh, default worker pool and we're using a username and password to connect. So if I go back to my uh, config nodes and run that, we should run that uh, successfully now. Uh, that was actually the wrong one book. I wanted to get the config map. Try again. Okay, so this is our config map. And so what this is, is a mapping of um, I am credentials, so in this case, we've used roles, but uh, you can actually use I am users um, and groups, I believe, as well. And so by default, what you would see is something like this. So this would be the, the stock standard config map that you get in a newly created cluster. And what we've done under this map roles key here is uh, added another mapping that essentially says this role and I'll show you where this, um, this full uh, identity ID comes from. So this role, anything, anyone who has this role is uh, associated with the master uh, group in Kubernetes. So that gives you access to, to everything essentially in, uh, in Kubernetes. And so that role, that, uh, that full key comes from to roles. Uh, it's this one here. So that's where those, uh, those identifiers come from. And so the, the important thing to note is that none of the policies that are attached to this role mean anything inside Kubernetes really. Um, we're really just using this role as an identifier, just a way of mapping individuals or you know machines into kubernetes and then once they're in kubernetes they are granted certain kubernetes specific permissions but the permissions that have been assigned to the uh the role itself don't really have any um meaning in, in this case um and so yeah so i've already updated this so that means that uh this role is already uh, 
recognized inside the cluster and that's why the um, uh, assuming the role of the worker allowed me to complete the health check successfully. So the, the that error that I got caught out by before is definitely something to pay attention to. The, um, the way workers are selected uh, when they are put on a target is um, is important and maybe not quite as straightforward as you might think. So what I'll do is uh, I'll select the work pool again. And so the, the effect of setting this uh, worker pool here means that the health checks uh, always run on this worker pool. And the steps that reference this target may or may not use this worker pool. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So I have this uh, this step here, or this run book, I should say. And again, you'll notice it's based on this um, inspect resources community step template. And this step template is written in PowerShell. And so obviously the location where we are running our um, uh, where, the, where the target is running needs to have PowerShell on it for this to complete. And the, this, uh, this Linux EC2 doesn't currently have PowerShell. So that's, uh, that's not installed and that's not available. And so we can use that to demonstrate uh, or, or call out fairly clearly where this uh, particular step is working because it'll either fail or run uh, depending on the selection of the pool. So what I've done here, this step has the default worker pool set up and it targets the uh, Kubernetes target that has the, uh, the worker pool set to the, um, the Linux based EC2. And what's actually going to happen is the Kubernetes target worker pool will be the, be where the code is run because when the step has the default worker pool, it defers to the target. And so what we'll actually see here is this will fail because uh, the, the Linux based virtual machine that we've used as the target for the Kubernetes target, sorry, we've used as the worker pool for the Kubernetes target doesn't have PowerShell on it. So you're saying um, the worker pool you choose in the step does not get used when you're targeting a Kubernetes cluster that has a different worker pool assigned to it? Uh, it will in certain cases. So in this case, the step worker pool was ignored, but that's only because it was the default worker pool. And that's, the, that's just the way it's been implemented. So we can see here this has failed because it's, it's tried to run a PowerShell step on the target associated with the, uh, on, sorry, on the, on the worker pool associated with the target. If I go back and we change that pool, uh, so I have a second pool here that has a uh, Windows machine running as a worker. And that obviously has PowerShell on it. And so what's gonna happen here is because I've selected a non-default worker pool on the step, the step worker pool wins. And we should expect to see this succeed. And there we go, so that's run. It's pretty tricky. Yeah, look, it's something to keep an eye out for. I think this is going to trip some people up. So uh, if, if this does come through support, just be aware that the logic is maybe not as straightforward as it, uh, as it might appear. Uh, and so this only worked because I was not using the IAM role. So if we go back to the cluster, the target here, you can see that I had the, the account set in the target. And that means it can run anywhere. We're not we're not relying on those roles associated with the EC2s. If I went back 
and actually change that. And so this, this might seem sensible, right? Because my worker pool is, is a worker that has an IAM role associated with it and the health check's gonna pass. So it looks like everything's good. But uh, what's actually gonna happen in the step is because the step has a non-default worker pool, that non-default pool wins and that non-default pool has no uh, I am roles associated with it and I'm not going to be able to log on. So what's actually happened here is the that step was now run on uh, this EC2. Uh, this one here, and as you can see, this one has no role associated with it. So it has no role to inherit, and that's why we get this failure here. Uh, it just, it, it can't, it has no credentials anymore to run. So there is a uh, an interplay here of the, the uh, worker pool set on the step and the worker pool set on the target and the targets need to inherit an IAM role that, um, that definitely has some uh, potential to, to trip people up. So that's something to, to be aware of. Um, so the other option we do have on these sorts of steps is the, uh, let's have a look here. Actually, I'll create a new one. This starts to get uh, a few levels deeper again. Um, so we go over, we'll just do a script step. And so we will inherit the role from our um, the EC2. And then we have this second level where we can then go and inherit yet another role. So what actually happens here is uh, if we go back to the IM, I'm just gonna create a second role that we're gonna jump into. Uh, I'm going to select EC2 here, but we're actually going to replace that trust relationship that we saw before. Uh, I just haven't, I've had a look through this list and I can't find the option that allows one role to uh, assume another, but that's okay. We're just going to copy and paste and, uh, and clean that up later. So let's call this uh, my second role. All right, and uh, what we need from here is uh, the trust relationship to the first role. So that looks like uh, this. Uh, I do need to replace that. Uh, this here is not valid, so I need to replace this. So what we're saying now is just as before we had a role that any EC2 could inherit. What we're now saying is this relationship allows this role to inherit it. So we've, uh, we've gone from the EC2, EC2 to a role, and then we go from that role to the second one. So I'll grab that uh, ARN. Uh, now this will be bash because we'll have to run it on the on the bash on the Linux worker. Again, I'm calling the the who who am I uh, AWS command, 
and I need to run it on that pool. All right, and if I've done everything correctly, what we'll see is that uh, we'll actually be running in the context of this second role. There we go, my second roll. Uh, so yeah, to, to just clarify what's actually happened here is the first, the, this run book has run on a worker and that worker has an I am role associated with it. And then from that role associated with the EC2 where the worker runs, we've then gone and assumed a second role and uh, the end result here is that every action that this uh, deployment takes is then done in the context of this second role and that same um, that same logic does also apply to the uh, EKS cluster as well so we do have that same secondary uh, inheritance that's under this one. So if I said uh, yes here, actually I'll do it. It won't work, but we can see it. We expect this to fail because this second role has not been configured in the Kubernetes cluster. So the Kubernetes cluster itself doesn't know or respect this role and this should fail. Okay, let's do connectivity. But what we might actually do is update that config map to uh, allow the second role access and, and we'll get a green health check. Right. Uh, so as, as expected, the Kubernetes cluster doesn't know who, who the second role is and uh, my health check has failed because it considers it to be unauthorized. So what we can actually do here is fairly simple though. We just take this config map and uh, stick in this second role. So we'll get that ARN, paste it here. And so what I've said is whether you've got this first role here, whether you've got the second one, both of these are now kind of admins within the system. Uh, to paste this back, I actually need to get rid of a lot of this rubbish though. Let's get rid of all of that. Okay. Update config map. So this is the run book that I used before to set that first role, give that first role permissions in Kubernetes. So we'll just actually update this and give it the, uh, the second um, map. Actually, what I can do, it might just be easier if I copy and paste that one bit. Uh, the only catch is I'm actually gonna have to revert the changes that I made to that target because I'm using that same target to apply these changes. So I'll just go back and give it the uh, username and password, which will give me admin access. And then we'll go back and uh, inherit that role again. Uh, but it's not healthy, is it? Okay. So I'm just gonna go back to the kind of default setup. Assume role, nope, that was KAS cluster two. Just make sure that worked.
There we go. Okay. So I can now run this just through the uh, traditional access key secret key that we've assigned to that target. thinking oh okay this is a uh, the uh, we do use some native tools when deploying uh, kubernetes applications and jq is one of them i think all we need to do here is uh, Oh, right, it's yum. Okay. Yep, beautiful. Let's try that one again. Okay, so now that that config map has been applied, the Kubernetes cluster, or the target, I should say, no. so the Kubernetes cluster does now understand that second uh, role that we just added. And so now we can uh, inherit that role and the health check should work. There we go. So uh, what are the takeaways from this from a support point of view? Uh, I think the, the first thing to understand is how the trust relationships between roles work. So roles can trust other roles. Uh, roles can trust uh, services like EC2. They can trust other things as well, but uh, roles and EC2s are the two things that Octopus are mostly interested in. Um, the need to then have a worker for a target to complete the health checks if they're going to assume the role is also important. Uh, so you do definitely need to have the, uh, a worker pool with, uh, with workers SSHing or even um, the Linux uh, tentacles as well, the polling and listening would, would work too. Uh, into those instances to get that um, that role associated with the EC2. The interplay between the target worker pool and the step worker pool is uh, important if you're trying to diagnose issues. So again, just to recap, the health checks are always done with the worker pool assigned to the target. So you can you can correctly set up a target and have it uh, pass all its health checks, but still run into problems because the step will only use this worker pool if the step has the default worker pool itself. If the step has a second pool, that pool is used. And uh, as we've seen before, it may not have roles on it at all. It may not even be an EC2 instance. So those, uh, those can start to fail. And uh, again, probably just the, the relationship between kind of the first level of login and this second assumed role. 
So you can uh, you can log in with a username with the sorry the AWS account, which is the access and secret key, and then assume a second role, or you can do what we've done here, which is assume the role from the EC2 and then assume a second role. And finally, it would be that uh, to have all this work with Kubernetes, you do need to modify this config map here called AWS Auth to make sure that the uh, the roles or the users are trusted with, within the cluster because that's not an automatic thing. Um, you are expected to do that yourself manually. So that's all I really wanted to show off for this uh, session. Did you guys have any questions or anything we wanted to dig into a little bit more? Oh, sounds like uh, it's all quiet. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Yeah. So hopefully that was useful. Um, so these features are coming out in 2020.4. Uh, Actually, I will show you what they look like today, just so you may be aware what some of the words that people might be using. Uh, so this is my uh, this is my hosted cluster here. It's just 2020.3. And if we look at the Kubernetes cluster target. Uh, you'll see, we, you just get the option of selecting an account. There's none of that inherit the role of the EC2 and there's no none of the options to get that second role. So this was one of the requests that we got through the support channel. Actually, I think it was through the uh, community Slack that led to the, uh, this being related. But that is everything I had to share today. So uh, I think we might, uh, might wrap it up there. Well. I had a quick question, Matt. Okay, um, I, I was like two or three minutes late, so I'm not sure if you showed it. And I can go back to the recording if you did. But um, did you show the initial setup of that role and then also, you know, integrating it into that um, VM and all that stuff at uh, the beginning? Yeah, that was, I could do that fairly quickly. They're, okay. They're, uh, so I just jump back into IAM here. Actually, the, the creation of that second role was the same as the first. Okay. Uh, all, we, all we did was left that trust relationship to the default of EC2. We didn't actually change it to be a um, trust a second, uh, trust a, another role. The part that you pasted in. Yeah, so everything from that part that I pasted in back is um, is the same. Yeah, creating the instance, again, it's, it's pretty simple. I'll just run through it again. Again, okay. Uh, so it's this screen here, I am role. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, that's where this test role was selected. Mm. And so if I- And then to, to do the, uh, the trust relationship, then you did that YAML where you basically made the admin user for this test, or but it was Matt dash test role or whatever, right? Right, I had one uh, set up previously. This was the one we set up in the demo, but just to, okay to speed things through, I actually use this one here, which I'd set up earlier. Okay, and that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, if we were to trust this test role here, it would just be a case of grabbing its, uh, its ARN and uh, pasting it into here. And then that, that role would be trusted as well. All right, thanks, that makes sense. Okay, all right, well, thank you guys. And uh, I'll, I'll see you next time. Thanks for doing another one. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.